The Battle of Kursk is one of the biggest tank-on-tank -tank battles in the history of armoured warfare. For several days hundreds of Soviets and German tanks clashed against each other on the vast plains of Soviet Russia. One of those tanks was commanded by SS Obersturmführer Rudolf von Ribbentrop, who would see major action with the 1st SS Bahn's division, Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, near the town of Prokhorovka. After six tiresome days of heavy fighting, the 2. SS Panzer Corps under the command of SS Obergruppenführer Hauser was located in the vicinity of Prokhorovka. The day after, July 12, 1943, would see one of the most iconic tank battles of the entire Eastern Front, and possibly of the entire war, the Battle of Prokhorovka. The German 2nd SS Panzer Corps with the 1st, 2nd and 3rd SS Panzer Divisions had made plans to attack the Soviet positions at Prokhorovka. The Soviets on their turn had also made plans to counterattack the German forces near the town. The Soviet 5th Guards tank army was moved to the vicinity of the town to perform a series of counterattacks on a frontage of 30 kilometers with a whopping 850 tanks. Their task was to eliminate the threat posed by the three German SS divisions. In the midst of it all was the commander of the 6. Kompanie, SS Panzerregiment I. The 22-year-old SS Obersturmführer Rudolf von Ribbentrop, nicknamed Rudi and Kunibert. Opposing him would be the T-34s of the 18th and 29th Tank Corps. As the name may suggest, Rudolf von Ribbentrop was the son of Nazi Germany's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Joachim von Ribbentrop. Before the war, he was the German ambassador in London, and so Rudolf spent a few years studying in England. His father Joachim would after the war be hanged for the horrendous crimes against humanity. Rudolf chose to be on the front line even though he had the option of a less dangerous military career because of his family background. This is his account of the Battle of Prokhorovka on the 12th of July 1943. Please note that this is solely the view of Rudolf von Ribbentrop on the battle. I'll probably release a more in-depth video on the Battle of Prokhorovka itself if the demand is there. After waking up with his crew underneath their Panzer IV numbered 605, von Ribbentrop and his crew could see the purple smoke in the distance. Panzer Alarm. Ribbentrop met with his battalion commander, SS Sturmbahnführer Martin Gross, in the battalion headquarters where he received his orders of the day. The infantry had signalled several groups of Soviet T-34s and several small raids had already been made by the Soviet armour on the German positions. Ribbentrop's 6. Kompanie was to support the infantry and intervene where necessary. Upon his return to his company, Ribbentrop ordered his men to mount up their Panzer Falls and follow him into battle. Shortly after, his seven tanks arrived near Hill 252.2, with in front of it a vast plain which was defended by the 3rd Battalion of the 2nd Regiment of SS Grenadiers under SS Sturmbahnführer Joachim Piper. The defence consisted of a number of trenches and foxholes. A prominent feature in the defence was a large ravine, which could only be crossed by a wooden bridge. The young Ribbentrop decided to put his tanks just beyond the Dugin SS Panzergrenadiere in the valley, so that they could shoot at any Soviet tank which crested the hill in front of them. When they were in position, von Ribbentrop spotted a group of around 20 T-34s to his left at a distance of 800 meters, the perfect distance for a good gunner. He ordered his company to fire at will and within minutes, Several T-34s caught fire, and the threat was dealt with, without taking any returning fire. After the first engagement, von Ribbentrop scanned the area with his binoculars, until he spotted 20, 30, 40 Soviet tanks, too many to count, at just 500 meters to his right front. And on top of each T-34 were another handful of infantry riding along. Baffled by the sight, von Ribbentrop was shouted at by his driver to make a decision, instead of just watching the grand spectacle. At that particular moment during the battle, von Ribbentrop's Panzer IVs were far too isolated and well ahead of the defending Panzer Grenadiers of the SS Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler Division. The division could only rely on von Ribbentrop's Sechse Kompanie and the Panzer Grenadiers of Joachim Piper to hold that particular part of the line. Just when SS Obersturmführer von Ribbentrop shouted the order to open fire to his gunner, his driver was already on the verge of fleeing the horrible sight. 
When he was kicked back in his post, von Ribbentrop ordered his gunner to pivot the turret to the right in order to bring fire upon the ever-nearing Soviet T-34s. The first shell hit the target, which was only a mere 60 meters away. When von Ribbentrop's tank was about to pivot the turret round again, the adjacent tank, the Panzer IV of SS Unterscharfuhrer Papke, burst into a huge ball of flames. The tank was hit by multiple Soviet shells. Papke, the commander, was the only one to escape the inferno. He was evacuated from the carcass of the Panzer IV, but Papke would later die due to the wounds received during the blast. With the first wave of Soviet tanks being right upon the Panzer Falls, a new group was spotted, and behind that group another wave of tanks. Tank after tank, wave after wave crashed into the line of the Panzer Falls, and all of that in just several minutes. The German gunners fired ferociously at the oncoming Soviet tanks, and with each shot a new tank was knocked out. By that time, von Ribbentrop had already accepted his faith that he was to die on the 12th of July 1943. But nonetheless, he fought on, and in very quick succession, he knocked out three or four T-34s less than 30 meters from his tank. Isolated, encircled, and low on ammunition and fuel, there was only one option for von Ribbentrop and his men. They had to break out of the encirclement and move towards a better defendable position. Fortunately for the company, a small peak which could protect them from the view of the Soviet tankers was located just behind them. Just when they were moving back, they were joined by several T-34s. One of them was stopped dead in his tracks, just 30 meters from von Ribbentrop. The immobilized T-34 started to turn the turret towards von Ribbentrop's Panzer IV, and just when he could see right into the T-34's gun barrel, von Ribbentrop shouted to Schüler, his driver, to get his Panzer on the move again, as every second could result in the death of the entire crew. Panzer IV, Marsch, Marsch! Whilst zigzagging, the Panzer IV came to about 5 meters from the T-34, who was following every movement of Ribbentrop's Panzer. He ordered his Panzer to stop 10 meters behind the T-34, and from there von Ribbentrop's crew was able to fire at the immobilized T-34, knocking the turret clean off. Of the seven Panzer IVs of which the Zesta Company consisted, only four remained in a state of battle readiness after the 30 minute long engagement. Von Ribbentrop knew that the only way to keep him, his crew, and the rest of his company alive was to keep moving and drive to friendly lines. He was however faced with a big problem. How on earth could the friendly Germans in their defensive positions distinguish retreating Panzer IVs between the wrecks of German and Soviet tanks? How could they distinguish themselves from attacking Soviet tanks so they wouldn't be fired upon by their own guns? Eventually, von Ribbentrop took the risk of being killed by a friendly shell and dashed towards the friendly lines. Von Ribbentrop stated in an interview after the war that the only reason why he was still alive that day was the fact that the Soviet T-34s didn't have a commander at the time. During the retreat, von Ribbentrop took the moment to report his position back to the division. Although he tried every single frequency, no reply returned. On the roof of his Panzer, von Ribbentrop had a large swastika flag in order not to be killed by friendly aeroplanes. He tried in vain to tear it off. His plan to take the flag off failed completely, and he only managed to tear off a small bit of the flag. The flag was then waving in the wind, making his Panzer a prime target. Von Ribbentrop and his company moved back to friendly lines in the flow of the T-34s, so they wouldn't be noticed by their Soviet enemy. Finally, von Ribbentrop could see the battered remnants of the German half-tracks in the distance. He could also see the destroyed vehicles belonging to the artillery regiment. They were only a hundred meters away from the entrenched Panzergrenadier of Piper, but the four Panzers still had to cross the makeshift bridge of the ravine used as an anti-tank ditch. When they advanced once more, they found several groups of Soviet infantry trying to find shelter from the hellish fighting. Upon hearing the engine noises of the tanks, they broke the cover, only to be gunned down by the German machine gun fire. After that, yet another T-34 presented itself, only to be destroyed moments later by one of the Panzer IV's 75mm guns. Once von Ribbentrop's four remaining Panzers crossed a wooden bridge, they would be back in friendly lines. Unfortunately for them, another group of T-34 supported by infantry was looking for a way to cross the anti-tank ditch as well. 
When they would cross the bridge, the Leibstandarte's positions could collapse like a house of cards. Von Ribbentrop and his men positioned themselves behind the wrecks of some T-34s, and on the other side of the anti-tank ravine were several puck guns, which were operated by the men under Piper. They waited cautiously for the Soviets to come in their ambush. When the puck guns opened fire, all hell broke loose around the Panzer Falls. Several T-34s were seen destroyed. Von Ribbentrop was in a bleak situation. Heinz Trautmann, his loader, shouted that the last shell was loaded in the gun, and at that exact moment his gunner, Kurt Hopper, was screaming that he was hit in his eyes. A Soviet shell had hit the visor and pushed it back by several millimeters, hurting the gunner's eye. With his panzer damaged, von Ribbentrop finally decided to make a run for the bridge. He could only hope that the puck gunners on the other side would recognize his panzer in time. Fortunately for von Ribbentrop, they did, and he and the remaining men of his company finally reached friendly lines. He could now finally measure up the damage and check on his wounded gunner. Von Ribbentrop's day at Prokhorovka wasn't over yet. When he was measuring up the damage, he heard a tank approaching. It was the tank of an NCO who was ordered by SS Sturmbahnführer Gross to give von Ribbentrop a new panzer to operate in. With the pressure forced upon the German defenders, every single panzer in the line could make a difference. So in the new panzer numbered 604, von Ribbentrop rolled back into action to support his remaining panzer falls in a battle around the wooden bridge over the anti-tank ravine. The Soviet attack was broken and von Ribbentrop and his company stayed close to the friendly line so they could be easily tracked if new orders were to come in from the divisional headquarters. Eventually a message came in stating for a counterattack in order to recapture the lost ground and to push the Soviet forces back over the plain. By noon, Hi-252.2 was back in German hands. Von Ribbentrop's company had suffered dearly. Many experienced tankers were killed on the 12th of July 1943. Of the company, two Panzer IVs were completely destroyed. Most however had minor damage or were just immobilized. The biggest problem for not only the company, but for the entire German army was the loss of the irreplaceable, experienced tank crew. The Soviets lost around 200 KV-1s and T-34s to the 1st SS Panzer Division. Von Ribbentrop and his crew were credited with knocking out 14 of those. The 22-year-old minister's son would receive the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross for his actions at Prokhorovka. SS Obersturmführer Walter Marchow, the platoon commander, in Panzer 615 was credited with the destruction of seven tanks, although he could have had much more. Early on, Marchow's panzer was hit several times in the engine compartment, forcing the crew to bail out. Once the crew was out, the panzer exploded into a huge ball of flames. The Soviet 5th Guards Army and 5th Guards Tank Army had an enormous numerical advantage, but they let a victory slip away as they didn't have a proper plan and Piper and von Ribbentrop acted perfectly in breaking wave after wave of Soviet tanks. Von Ribbentrop later stated that victory was achieved due to superb education and leadership. This was the Ace Destroyer. I hope you have enjoyed this little video. Please let me know if you would like to see the Battle of Prokhorovka video. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more. And drop a comment below. Cheers!